Praise the Lord. Amen. It is so good to be here uh, for Bible study tonight. This is Tuesday night. It's our favorite night of the week. Amen. As we're continuing our study on uh, the relationship thing, uh, I'm here live at New Beginnings Church. Uh, I'm lonely. I miss all of y'all that are uh, not able to be here with us on Tuesday night, but we love you. Uh, we're, we want you to remember uh, during this time to be patient. Uh, it's taking all of us to be patient, especially me. Uh, I'm sure even for you, you have to be patient and not fall into the temptation to be excessively social and getting out and doing the things that you might like to do otherwise. The thing is, is that right now, uh, the way our government is set up and the way decisions are being made, uh, it's almost like uh, we're in an experimental phase with this virus. Here are the facts. Here are the things that we know. We know that we don't know anything. Uh, we don't know how to stop this virus. Uh, we don't have a cure to this virus. We don't have a vaccination for the virus. There's limited treatment that we can do for the virus. And week by week, even day by day, they're coming up with new facts about the virus, things that we don't know that are affecting people in our family, our children, our young ones. We were told at one point, ah, mostly just old people get it. And then young people started dying. Uh, they said that, well, no, uh, only certain races get it. Uh, black people don't get it. And then black people started dying. Uh, most of the deaths in the St. Louis area have been in uh, predominantly black areas. And so you gotta recognize uh, I'm not trying to politicize this because that's not my motivation, uh, but you've got to realize that we don't know a lot. And so since we don't know a lot, that means you have to be extra precautious during this time to make sure that you and your family are safe. Amen. Whatever that means for you, you need to do that. Amen. That means continuing to do your hand washing. If you're out in public and you're with other people, get a mask, take a mask use the gloves, use the hand sanitizer, wash your hands, change your clothes, all of those things like that, because you don't want to be the source of the next bit of information where we find out something that we didn't know. And then we say, oops, now we know that that works. We don't want that to be you. So let's take a little extra time uh, in St. Louis City and St. Louis County, We've got a couple of more weeks uh, where the mayor and the county executive have asked us to continue to shelter at home. So let's just take that time and, and do the things that you need to do. But when you're doing that, be careful. And then outside of that, go home and relax and, and spend time with your family. Amen. So again, we're going into uh, our study on the relationship thing. Tonight is a, a special night. I want to also encourage, if you have teenagers that are out there, we want to encourage them to log in on our Zoom chat. That's just for the teens. Let's talk about it with Dr. Danny. Uh, this is our teen night, the first Tuesday of the month, and we want them to join in with her and have a good time. They should be logging in right now. I know that she's there and ready to go. So please, if you don't have, if you didn't know, Look on my page, you should see the flyer, the Zoom login information. You don't need a password or anything, just click in and enjoy what they have going on there. You adults, uh, we've got some real adult conversation tonight on the relationship thing. Yep, yep, we're going to talk about uh, the grown folk. And uh, in and, and particular tonight, we're going to talk about sex. So I'll give you two or three minutes to tell everybody to jump on the, on the line and make sure they're in here. Share this, tag people. Uh, you know who needs to be in this discussion. Tag them in and let's get them in because tonight we're going to talk about sex. Amen. So uh, while I'm still a preacher and before they, you know, unfrock me and all that stuff like that, I'm just going to tell you the way we do ministry at New Beginnings, the way we do ministry at Ephesus and all of our churches is that we don't sugarcoat things. We try to keep things 100% uh, true. Uh, we try to talk about things like humans, amen, and most importantly, it's a judgment-free zone. 
uh, in this discussion, our goal is not to, to prove who's the most saved. Our goal is not who's to prove who's the least holy. Uh, it, it's not to judge you because of what you have done or what you didn't do or what you should have done or what you thought about doing. Uh, there are some people, I, I hate to let you know this, but there are some people in church uh, that are, are having sex. Um, shame on us, uh, but they, they exist. Uh, there are some people that used to have sex and they stopped. There's some people that wasn't having sex and they started. Amen. Uh, there are some people that are married and having sex. There are some people that are married and not having sex. Uh, th there are some people uh, that are getting married so they can have sex. Amen. And we want to talk about all of those things. We want to be able to deal with it directly, uh, to give you some biblical foundation for what we believe uh, because I'm social distancing today. I apologize, but I don't have my staff with me. Uh, so I'm, I'm here by myself. Amen. So I don't have anyone that can throw these questions at me. And I'm not uh, good enough to, to be able to catch those questions from a distance on camera and, uh, and know what you said. So I'm going to try to hit all the points that I can. But I want to encourage you. If you have a question, a serious question, about some of the things that we're talking about, please don't hesitate to post it on this chat. Don't, don't worry about it. You can post it right here in the comments. Uh, and if it's something that's very personal and you feel like uh, you'd be more comfortable with everybody not being in it, you can inbox me directly. And I promise you that I will send you a reply to your question. I don't know if it'll answer all your questions, but I will definitely respond to you and we can have some discussion on that and we can give you some biblical resources to support what we think and what we're going through. Amen. Amen. So I, I think it's very important that we talk about the tough things uh, in the relationships and don't just act like that's not a problem. So I'm going to be very judgmental and presumptuous, and I'm going to say some things that a lot of people may not say amen to, but those three of you that are going to say amen, I appreciate your likes and your shares and your hearts and your claps uh, to keep me encouraged while we're going through all of this. Amen. Look, uh, normal people that were made in the image of God, amen, born of a woman, amen, those people uh, it's normal for you to have what we call a sexual desire. It's the, uh, maybe I should say this different. Saved people that are born of a woman, amen, and, and live on earth with feet and things like that. It is normal for you to have a sexual desire, not just love, not just speaking tongues, amen, but it's normal for you to have a sexual desire. What, what we want to talk about is how to manage those desires, amen. It is nothing wrong with you wanting. Let me tell you, uh, if you are getting married, uh, if you are dating, courting, uh, or, or you already married to someone, one of the things that you should have is a sexual desire for your spouse. Amen. It's, it's not normal to pursue a, a marriage uh, or a relationship with someone that's not attractive to you. And especially not someone that's physically attractive to you. Now, what's physically attractive to me might be different than what's physically attractive to the next person. Some people like skinny people. Some people like big people. Some people like tall and some people like short. It does not matter. There is someone that likes everyone that's just like they are. The thing is, is that what you like has to be attractive and appealing to you so that you can pursue and desire that person. 
All right? Now, what we want to make sure that we're doing is that we're doing that in the order that God has given and that God has given. So let's jump right into the scripture and make everybody mad right off the top. Here is, uh, I'm going to deal with the single people first. Let me deal with the single people first. Uh, and that includes me. And so we'll all be frustrated together. Amen. In this regard, here's what the Bible says about single people and sex. If you turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, the 6th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to start reading at the 13th verse. Amen. 6th uh, uh, chapter, 1 Corinthians, 13th verse. It says, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. Fifteenth verse. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot, God forbid. 16th verse, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? That's important. Remember that verse, the 16th verse. Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the 18th verse is the theme for single people concerning sex. 18th verse says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let's go back to the 18th verse. The 18th verse says very clearly, 1 Corinthians 6 chapter and the 18th verse says flee fornication. Look, this is the only commandment that God gives us concerning fornication. He does not say pray that you don't fornicate. He does not say cast the devil out of fornication, anoint yourself with oil, uh, uh, fast, or, or anything like that. He said the, the simple solution for fornication is to run away from it. Flee. Stay away. Get as far away from it as possible. Like it's corona. That's what you want to do is, is get away from from fornication. That's God's solution concerning that. Now, that is not our desire. That's God's commandment. The reason why God gives us a commandment is because the thing that he's commanding us to do, we would not do it unless God gave us the commandment. Some of us are still going to do it even though God gave us the commandment. What we do is we, we make the error of trying to live as close to the line as possible to do as much as we absolutely can and still be all right with God. We start asking questions like, can I do this and get saved and still be saved? Uh, we we want to know, uh, is it all right if I masturbate, does that count? Uh, if I'm clothes burning, does that count? If we just touching and petting, does that count? If I do oral sex, does that count? Uh, if, if we if we don't get married one day, but we ain't married yet, does that count? Uh, we want to say, well, what if we just watching uh, or, or each other or touching each other or, or looking at each other on FaceTime or, or whatever like that? If I'm on, what can I do and get away with? How close can I get? And, and, and here's what's broken in our plan. Our plan is to get as close as possible 
to, to something that God is saying run as far away from as possible. <laughs> see how we messed up? <laughs> We're trying to see how close can I get and still be all right. And God is saying, get as far away as possible. Now, let me take a time out and take you all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of deep. Okay, you all remember that. And fast forward to the second chapter. And then God made man in his own image. Amen. And the man he called Adam. And he called the deep sleep to come upon the man. And, and then he took one of his ribs and he fashioned a woman. And, and then when the man woke up and said, now this is a good thing. Amen. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I'm going to call her woman. Amen. Because she was taken taken from the man, and then what happened is that they were together and they were naked and they were not ashamed because they were not in sin, and God gave them a commandment, and the commandment that he gave them was not, not to fornicate. Matter of fact, he told them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, but the commandment that he gave was, there is one tree in the center of the garden that I want you to stay away from. Don't touch it. Stay away from it. Don't eat the fruit of this tree. If I can uh, isogene into this, it, basically what the scripture said is, flee this tree. Flee this tree. And, and so uh, instead of fleeing the tree, Eve was hanging around the tree. And she was hanging around the tree, and it said, and the serpent was more subtle than the other beasts of the field. And he came upon Eve, and he saw her looking at the tree that she was supposed to flee. And he asked her, uh, did God say you can't eat of that fruit? Did God say if you eat of this tree, you're going to surely die? And, and, and Eve said, yeah, that's what he said. And then the devil said, no, you're not going to surely die. He just knows that you're going to like it. He just knows that you're going to get what you want out of it. He just knows that it's going to feel good. He just knows that, that that's your desire and he's mean and he wants to keep you from having fun. And so what, what, he, what Eve did was look at the fruit that she was supposed to be fleeing. And when she looked at the fruit, it looked good to her. God never said the fruit didn't look good, but when she started looking at what she was supposed to be fleeing, it looked good to her, so she took it. And when she took it, then she ate of it. And when she ate of it, she checked herself, and she had not died. And then the devil became, uh, in her eyes, uh, telling the truth because she ate the fruit that had been forbidden, that she knew she wanted, but for some reason God wouldn't let her have. And so she ate the fruit, and then she said it was good. And it was so good that she took it to the man, and she gave it to the man. Now, I always find this interesting that God didn't interrupt before the fruit got to the man. But, but instead what happened is he allowed the woman to take the forbidden fruit to the man. And then the man saw the fruit that the woman was bringing and he knew that God said don't eat of this fruit. And he knew that God said flee this fruit. And he knew that God said don't touch it, stay away from it, flee the fruit. And, and instead of fleeing the fruit, what he did was took the fruit and he ate it also. And he saw it was good. And only after they both ate the fruit did they realize that they were naked and they were ashamed. And so in their nakedness, then they began to go try and hide. What am I trying to say? I'm not trying to teach creation again. What I'm saying is, is that there are some things that you don't get the full revelation of until you're too far into it to escape it. Once Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit and they had both eaten of the fruit, then they were trying to take fig leaves and cover themselves. Then they were trying to hide in the bushes from the presence of God. Then came the conviction. Then came the sin 
part that they that God had already told them would be there, but they were not conscious of, but it didn't come to fruition until after they were too far into it. Haven't we been there? I know all of y'all ain't going to say amen to this, but haven't you been there where you say we're not going to do nothing? Uh, how, how about we just be together and, and we could just talk? Uh, what if we just hug a little bit? What if we just kiss a little bit? What if we just cuddle a little bit? Maybe we could just sleep together, but we ain't going to do nothing. We just going to sleep together. Okay, it got a little hot and heavy that time, but it's okay because we're under control and we know how far we can go and we know when we should stop and, and we're not going to mess up. We're not going to do this because God doesn't want us to do this. And, and I, I told God the last time, I'm never going to do this again. Amen. And then, whoo, that was pretty close. I almost uh, stopped. And then the devil comes in. And then the devil begins to slide in suggestions. And he says smooth things like, well, you was thinking about it. You might as well do it. Well, you came this close. You're just the same as doing it. So you might as well go all the way. Well, you've already had a climax, or you already had an orgasm, and you already feeling all of the stuff. Why hold back? You might as well do it all. You already in sin anyway, and the devil is a liar. Because what he does is he always pushes you too far and makes you stay too long. And then once you're out there too long, then he condemns you from being where you're not supposed to be. And then he talks, turns around and tells God on you. And then you feel bad and you try to walk back to God with your tail between your legs crying, saying, God, I don't know what happens. And then God calls you out on your stuff and says, you know exactly what happened. What happened is you didn't flee. And, and, and I'm telling you, uh, it, it, it doesn't always happen the first time. You might have been together for weeks. You might have been together for months. You might have been holding on strong, going hard for the king, amen, determined to give God glory in, in your relationship and all of that. And it only takes one time, amen, for one of you to be a little weak in that moment, in that situation, and bring forth what both of you have already wanted. Amen. And that's just the, the physical attraction that you already have for one another. Amen. Being manifested in a sexual passion that doesn't last long enough. And then once it's over, you feel terrible. Amen. I'll, I'll even tell you a little bit more. There are some people that have ruined great relationships. Amen. Because they soiled it with fornication outside of, of the, the order that God has given for you to have sex in the relationship. So then it begins to deteriorate. So then it, it be, it's not the same. It's not as special. Amen. One of my best friends, I honor him uh, because uh, to my knowledge and, and the things that we've shared and we're close enough to share, amen, that, that he saved himself until marriage before he has sex and he has a beautiful marriage and a beautiful family. Amen. And I honor him for that. That wasn't my testimony. Amen. I, 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 I'm sorry, disappointed. Somebody thought, no, I, I did the best I could. It just didn't work out. Amen. Amen. It just didn't work out like that in my life. But I honor and I celebrate him. Amen. For doing it the right way. Amen. And yes, I am calling that the right way. Amen. Here's the thing. The trap is, is that once you get in to a certain place physically, amen, it's hard to, to allow the spirit, amen, to minister to this relationship. It's hard to allow the spirit of God to minister in a relationship that's now being controlled by the flesh. Amen. I, I'm not giving the devil credit for anything other than uh, instigating. Amen. He only made you do what you wanted to do. Amen. He only encouraged you to do what you already wanted to do. But now you're in it. Amen. And so now you're in a situation. And so I have daughters. I, I have daughters uh, in the spirit. I have God daughters, natural daughters, all the above. And, and so when my daughters have had relationship problems, amen, and, and in some of those relationship problems, uh, the thing is that they have sex. Okay, well, 
I, I wish I could have another answer that would work better for you, but the premarital sex is a big part of the problem. Amen. If you weren't, let's, let's say you got a baby daddy that ain't no good. Okay. If you don't have sex, amen, you can't have baby daddies. If, if you don't have sex and you find out that he's no good, amen, you don't have a baby daddy that ain't taking care of his responsibilities and doing all of this stuff. Amen. It's a lot easier to walk away from a relationship where you haven't given yourself physically to that relationship. Fair enough? Amen. If we haven't gone all the way, amen, and we haven't shared all of this intimacy, amen, it's a lot easier in the very natural sense to say, you know what, I'm cutting my losses, I'm out. Amen. But once you start to physically be involved, I'm even kissing. Amen. Just here's, here's an acid test for you. If you got a, a, a bae, a boo, or whatever it is that you kissing, Right now, and y'all in a kissing relationship. Not sex, just kissing. Y'all kissing. This is what we do. We kiss. Mwah. I love you. Mwah. With all the extra stuff in the kissing. All right? And it's okay. Until next week, you see him kissing somebody else. You see him kissing her. If he's kissing her after he's been kissing you, we have a problem in this relationship. Can the church say amen? Anybody going to say amen for me right there? As soon as we have been to the place where we kissing, and then you kissing her, after I know we kissing, amen, see just that very base level of physical commitment is saying that I don't want to be kissing you and you kissing everybody else. I don't want to be kissing you and sharing your kisses with the other girls or the other men or both or whatever you do. That's not, that's not what we're looking for. But we've gone so far, amen, and we've extended ourselves to a place of vulnerability that we may or may not be able to support. So what happens when he goes out and he does something else? Even when he goes and does something else or when she goes and does something else, she takes that part of you with her. And, and then you stay, you live here broken and you're heartbroken and you're sad and you're depressed. Why? Because I thought that we had something special because I thought it was special because we kissed. And, and, if, and if I'm saying more than kissed, then I really thought it was special. When you took your clothes off and you revealed your body to him or you revealed your body to her, that was something special. When you had intimate physical contact with that person, then that's really special. Most of the people on earth should not see you naked. So if we have a naked relationship with someone, then that should be special. But it's special without the covenant that makes it special. So we've compromised the covenant of the relationship and accelerated to the benefits without an agreement. See, I didn't make an agreement to have in the whole for better or for worse in sickness and health to death do me part before you gave me the benefits package. And so now you're depending 100% on my integrity to hold what's most treasured by you and I haven't treasured it because I've invaded it without paying for it. It's like letting me go into the store and eat the whole bag of popcorn before I pay for it. Now you've got to depend on whether or not I'm going to be honest and pay before I leave. And a lot of times people don't. <laughs> they drop that bag in the trash and they walk out the door like they haven't had anything and that's what they do in your life. Amen. They came along. They had what they wanted. They enjoyed what they got. They did what they wanted to do. And then they walked right out of the door like that never happened. And oh, well, not for me. I'm on to the next person. What's her name? And then, and then we're devastated. And that's not just for women. That's men and women. And we respond to it differently. But the problem is, is that we're too deep into something that can't support the type of relationship that we're having. Scientifically, and, and yes, I, I can say science in church. 
Amen. Scientifically, uh, I believe science explains or tries to explain a spiritual occurrence. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, the Lord is saying, let there be light, and there was light. And science says there was a big boom. Amen. Yeah, there was a big boom. There was light. Amen. And, and, and life came out of it. Amen. And yes, that happened. And that's science trying to explain what God did. Make sense? Okay. So what science says is that you have a gland in your body, a pituitary gland. Some of you medical people, you can say that better than me. Uh, but you have a gland in your brain, and this gland secretes a hormone, and that hormone is called oxytocin. Amen. Let me read this from my notes to make sure I've got this right. The oxytocin is a hormone secreted by the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Amen. It's a pea-sized structure at the base of the brain and, and is somewhat known as the cuddle home hormone. And the cuddle hormone or the love hormone because it's released when people snuggle up or bond socially. When you cuddle, when you hug, when you snuggle up, when you kiss, when you spoon, when you lay together, when you hold hands, this hormone goes off and it starts spitting out this gland that says, I like it when he touches me. I like it when she holds my hand. I like it when she rubs my head. I like it when he squeezes my shoulders. Amen. I like it when he does the stuff that we ain't going to say publicly and he touches me here and there and all of them places. Amen. Every time they touch you there, then that gland begins to go off. And what that gland says is that this is the person that you're connected with. Before you physically are, are having sex, your brain is already having sex. I hope y'all got that. Before you have intercourse, your brain is already having sex and developing a, a physical, a physiological connection through the release of this hormone that says, this must be my man. This must be my woman. And so every time you touch, you increase the flow of this hormone in your system. Amen. That's the reason why this hormone is only supposed to be released on your wedding night when you consummate your marriage. When you consummate your marriage and he comes into her, literally, amen, and when he comes into her and this hormone goes off and says, this is your wife. This is the person you're supposed to be touching. This is the person you're supposed to be hugging. This is the person you're supposed to be kissing. And this is the person that you're supposed to desire sexually for the rest of your life. And no one else is supposed to make you feel this way. That's the way God made you. And that's why this hormone goes off in your body. Now, here's what we do. We crash that deal because we run and we hug everybody and we kiss everybody and we sleeping with everybody and we twerking and doing lap dances and fingering and, and touching and, and everything else in the name and licking and kissing and all kinds of parts. And we setting our hormones in confusion because they're like, who is the wife? Who is the husband? Is it her? Is it her? Is it him? Who is it? I don't know which person to connect with. And so you're with Sally and you're thinking about Lucy because your Lucy hormone is saying this is the way Lucy touches and now you married to Sally trying to convince Sally to touch you like Lucy because that's the way that you like it, the way Lucy do it, but you married to Sally and your hormones is confused because they don't know who you married to. Some of us have had so many sexual partners, so many sexual encounters that we all confused and freaky. 
And, and so we, we, we trying to go out and stimulate our own self to, to, to bring back the feeling or uh, uh, the ghost of sexual past to make it work again when it was always working the way it was supposed to work. The problem is, is that you got too many people going off in your brain. Your gland is, is trying to connect with too many people and, and what the devil said was not going to hurt you and that God just knows that you're going to like it and God just knows that it's going to be fun and he made it for you to have desire and all of those things. Now the Garden of Eden, the forbidden fruit trap is set and now it's going off in you and you don't know what to do. There are some people that physically, and, and people are different about this, uh, there are some people that physically can't sleep uh, because their sexual desires is going haywire. And so they go and they buy friends. Can I say that in church? Well, y'all ain't here. Amen. They go, they go and they buy friends that can satisfy them. They, they go, uh, there's men that go and buy dolls. Amen. They're not real women. They just go buy a doll. Amen. So that they can pretend uh, to be having sex with somebody. Amen. So they can satisfy their sexual desire that's insatiable. It's not that the sex is insatiable. It's that their sin is insatiable. See, see the devil is never going to have enough. Sin is never satisfied. But it will set you up on an endless journey into, and you pick what your sin is. That's why we have alcoholism. That's why we have drug addiction. That uh, you pick what your sin is. Whatever it is that you, your sin is not going to be satisfied with you just having it once in a while. If you had it once, it's going to want you to do it again and again and again, and it's going to keep on telling you to get more and go find more, and now you're watching videos, and now you're watching on your phone, and now you buying movies, and now you're doing all of that stuff because your, your desire, your appetite for sex is never satisfied. And you can't sleep right, and you cuddling up with pillows and, and stuff like that, and you, you trying to, you know, do all kinds of freaky stuff to, to pretend like you're having sex because your system is out of control. And none of that would be, be out of control if you hadn't been having sex and you weren't supposed to. Yeah, the, way, the way mama used to say it, mama said, you never miss what you never had. And I'm telling you, sometimes mama didn't always say stuff the way I like it, but I'm going to testify she was telling the truth. Amen. She was telling the truth when she said that. See, if you had never been there, had that feeling, most of y'all, the first time you had sex, you lost your mind, you thought you was grown all of a sudden, what they, what they used to call you smelling yourself and all that stuff like that. Now you a man, you, you got two hairs on your chest. Amen. Can't nobody, do you want to fight grown men and all that stuff because you a man now because you done had sex. And sex has got you all messed up in the head, confused and everything because you're trying to run around and prove that you're a woman, prove that you're a man and I can do what I want to do and you fast and all of that stuff like that just because you ate this forbidden fruit. And God is saying, you could have had good sense if you would have just left that tree alone. You could have had good sense and been fine and skipped a lot of perils, a lot of headaches. Think about it. Tell me about it. Tell me about some of the things that you suffered just because you went there and you never should have gone there. Tell me about the abusive relationship that you were in, that you never should have been in, but he was cute. Amen. And, and then he had a... Uh, uh, Big features. Amen. And so you, you got turned on by his big features and you had to see what it was like. Amen. And then now you in it. And then you in it and then, ooh, it was really good. Amen. So you want it again and then you now you addicted to what the I mean, never mind, I ain't gonna say it. But but you addicted and, and, and you and you gotta have it over and over again. But he's no good. And 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 he won't marry you and he won't take care of you. Amen. He doesn't even love you. Amen. And so, but but he's getting all the benefits, wearing you out so that you can be satisfied. And he keeps you satisfied in every way except the way that you need to be satisfied. See, see, the thing that's most important about a relationship is not sex. I, I guarantee you the most important thing about a relationship is not sex. Amen. It feels important, 
Uh, you might you might think it's important because of where you are in your life, amen, but it's not the most important thing about relationship. Now, I had some couples that I was counseling that were preparing to get married, and, and I said, I get it that sex is very important to you, uh, and then I would understand that it should be, but, but what happens if after you say I do, and you turn and you walk down the aisle, and then he slips on the rice, that they was throwing and falls down and fractures his spine and is paralyzed from the waist down and, and can never move again. Amen. Do you want a divorce now? Is this marriage now over? Because you're definitely not going to have no sex. Amen. Is, is that a good reason to leave the husband that you were determined that you had to have a few minutes ago? That you told God, the preacher, and all of these witnesses that you would have and hold in sickness and in health, and just moments later, his health has failed permanently, amen, uh, are you going to cheat? Are you going to leave him and then go have sex with some other guy because you have needs? Or are you going to be faithful to the covenant that you just made in the sight of God and man because you really loved him? See, see if that's the case, then what we have to do is find out what's really more important than sex in our marriage because a lot of times sex is motivating and sex is driving the marriage, even in church. Uh, and I've got another scripture passage here uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You can get that uh, even in church. A lot of times what we've done is we have pushed people to get married. Uh, whether it's a shotgun wedding or anointing all wedding or whatever kind of wedding it is, amen, y'all both here, you both single, you both like each other and you both hot under the collar, get married. Get married right now as soon as possible. And, and, and our favorite scripture that we would like to quote is in here, I'm going to get that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, amen. Uh, you all got that? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm going to begin at the first verse. It says, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's the oxytocin. See, God knew about that. It wasn't a surprise to him. The scientists didn't tell him. He told the scientists. It's not good for a man to touch a woman. Nevertheless, second verse, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. This is what the scripture says. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. It did not say you had to get married, but it's saying because we know you all have this desire for the sexual part to touch a woman, to touch a man and all of that stuff, to avoid the fornication part, let every man and every woman get married. That's what it's saying. Third verse. Let the husband give her some when she wants it. And let the and let the wife give him some when he wants it. Because I'm paraphrasing, but this is what the scripture says. Okay, let me read it so y'all don't say I misquoted the scripture. The, the fourth verse says, I'm sorry, third verse says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. Fourth verse, for the wife have not power of her own body. But the husband. And likewise, the husband have not power of his own body, but the wife. What that means in the Damon version of the Bible is let every man give her some, and let every woman give him some. Let every woman give him some whenever he wants it. And let every man give her some whenever she wants it, because that's the part of the duty of being married because we got this to avoid fornication because we desire one another. Now, I don't understand why it is, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to come back to the scripture. I don't understand why it is that we can't help it before we get married. We've got to be together. We've got to sleep together. We've got to touch, hug, kiss, and do all of the other stuff, you know, birds and bees stuff. We got to have sex before we get married, then we get married and we don't have sex. Then we get married and we don't kiss. Then we get married and we don't hold hands. It was necessary when we were dating. It was a requirement before we got married. Now, we don't even spend time together. 
You don't even want to come. Don't care about Netflix. Don't care about chilling. You just go past each other, and, and whenever it was one or the other make the most complaint or it's a holiday, then you do something. See, that's something that's broken in us. But, but what it said is that you have the responsibility in your marriage, you have the responsibility to give him all, she, all he wants. You have the responsibility to give her all she wants. Amen. I, I had a person that was telling me one time they were going to help me to get married. Amen. They were praying for me. They were praying that the Lord would send me a good wife. I thanked them. I appreciated it. Amen. And, and, but they went on to talk a little bit too much. They said, because you need somebody that can cook for you and that can clean for you and that can put together your clothes and, and do your laundry and, and all of those things. You need somebody. And I said, wait a minute. Let me, let me interrupt you right there. I appreciate what you're saying, and I'm thankful that you're praying for me, but I want you to pray right. Amen. So I know how to cook. Amen. I'm a good cook. I, I, I cook so good that my mother eats my cooking. Amen. So I, I know how to cook. Amen. I, I know how to clean. Amen. And I know how to do laundry and all of that stuff. Like I can handle. I've been handling that for 40 some years. I know how to do all of that stuff like that. But if you're going to pray, would you pray that, that I get this wife that, that every time I get ready, she go over here and I ram her into this headboard and we do the, the Adam and Eve thing, amen, as much as I want to. When I, when I wake up in the middle of the night and say, hey, get in the position, I want her to get in the position. I, I, don't, I don't need her to cook. I can do that, amen. I need her to do this, and I want to do that. She said, oh, my God, that, that's what you want. I said, well, if you're going to help me, help me. If you're going to pray, pray for what I want. I don't need a cook, amen. Red Lobster is open. They will cook, amen, but I can't do these other things with Red Lobster. See, and then, I, and I was kind of being silly, uh, but but when when they got the point, it was like you're trying to give me what you want to be, but you're not trying to be what I need, amen. And so, if you're marrying someone, amen, it became your responsibility because the osteosis is going off just for you, and so it became your responsibility to satisfy them sexually on demand when you don't feel like it. When you have a headache, when you're tired, when you just did it yesterday, regardless of what the scripture says, that is your job to be on demand, ready, because the body doesn't even belong to you. It belongs to your spouse. It belongs to your husband. It belongs to your wife. It's no longer yours. It belongs to them according to the scripture. So don't go tell God to make your wife stop wanting it all the time. Because God said your body belongs to her. That's, that's the reason why we in this relationship so that you can give her what she been praying for. Well, they don't get a lot of amens right there, but I'm preaching good even if you don't say amen. Amen. Uh, the fifth verse in that scripture says, Defraud ye not one another, except it be for consent for a time that you might give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. This is a big scripture right here. God said, God said, don't even separate yourselves. Don't deny one another sexually at all except if you agree to fast and pray. Okay, you're ready to fall out with some people, got to lose some viewers. Here's the thing. God said, ladies, even though your husband want it and, and you don't want to give it, amen, because you're in the spirit right now and you speaking in tongues, amen, and you in revival, Amen. And the anointment is on you and all of that stuff. And, and you are, and your husband says, on demand. Amen. The scripture says, except it be with consent for a time. That means you got to get permission from your husband 
before you decide to fast and pray and, and consecrate yourself, you got to get permission to withhold according to the scripture. This is not a man versus woman thing. It works the same way the other way around. When she says hit this spot right here, your job in life is to hit this spot right here. You don't got to tell her, I got mine, you should have got yours. Amen. I'm tired, give me a cigarette. Amen. I, I don't feel like we'll do it again tomorrow. No. Your job is to, is to bring satisfaction to your wife. Amen. And God said, I will wait until you all agree on a time to talk to me. That's deep. I don't, I don't care. That's deep right there. When God say, I know y'all got something to take care of, make sure y'all agree because God is not going to be responsible for your husband tipping because you ain't giving him none because you in the spirit. That, that ain't God that told you to be in that spirit, according to this scripture. Amen. If, if, if God tells you to get in that spirit again, go, go read this scripture to, to your God. Whoever told you don't be in that, you know, be in that spirit, say, well, God, your scripture says, amen, you might discern that the wrong God is speaking. Okay, I just want to make sure if you want to know how to have the gift of discernment of spirits, read this scripture, amen, to him and see what he said. Amen. He said, but, but Paul said, I, I speak this by permission and not by commandment, but don't y'all get super spiritual there and say, he said, he said that by permission. He said a lot of stuff by permission. Amen. There was a whole lot of preaching in the New Testament and a whole lot of writing in the New Testament that Paul did. Amen. That wasn't because it was in the Ten Commandments, that it wasn't a commandment from thou shalt not. But he is saying that you ain't supposed to, this is how it's supposed to work. Seventh verse says, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man has his own proper gift from God. One after this matter and one after that. Eighth verse, I say therefore to the unmarried and to the widows, it is, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Ninth verse, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. And I want to correct this scripture right here because some of you have made this a hell a hellfire thing. You have said it's better to marry than to burn. Meaning that if you don't get married and you keep fornicating, then that's going to send you to hell. I, I, that's debatable. That's not what we own right now. But this particular scripture in its proper translation is saying that it's better for you to marry than to burn with desire, than to burn with passion, than to burn in your lust. Meaning, if you know you can't handle it, you know you can't help it, and you know and you believe that you've got to be together and you, and you can't do that, then go ahead and get married. If you can't get married, then go ahead and don't be together. It's not saying that you've got to do one or the other. The choice is still yours. God is not a force you to do it type of God. But if you know that you can't help it, then don't stay in it and keep on not helping it. And if it's that important to you, and, you, and it's got that much of control over your life that you can't resist by any means necessary, go ahead and get married. But now, I, I, I have to say that in alignment with the scripture. Now, let's have some discussion about it. Is the reason you're getting married because you can't help it or because you want him? See, that's a, that's a big question. That's a big question. Is the reason, is, is when you say it's better to marry than to burn, are you just burning in lust? Or are you burning with a desire for that other person? Is it the passion that you have for this person that makes you get married? Or is it the need to satisfy your sexual desires? I have to slow all the way down to say that because that's a big part where we get confused, especially when we quote this scripture. 
We want to we want to say it's better to marry than to burn, and I'm on fire. So somebody marry me, please, and put this fire out. Amen. I can't wait to get to the honeymoon so he can put this fire out. And so, and so what really what you did is you enlisted a, a prostitute. Uh, you prostituted your husband to satisfy you sexually. I, I don't know what they call gigolos or johns or whatever it is. You brought home a, a jump off so you can knock all of the, uh, the whatever that you had to knock off of yourself so you could be satisfied sexually. But now you're in a marriage. And all the responsibilities of marriage come after the honeymoon. And now he wants you to do the cooking and the cleaning. And he wants you to, to listen to what he says. And he wants you to sit down when he says. And stand up when he says. And he wants you to leave all your friends. And he wants you to do all that. you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want that. I don't like that. Well, wives, submit yourselves unto your husband. Amen. He's the head of the woman like Christ, the head of the church. No, no, no. I'm not into that. He ain't right. He wasn't right when you were screwing him. Why, why you got to wait until now to determine that he ain't right? He never been right. You knew he wasn't right when you met him in the club. You weren't even supposed to be in the club. But you went to the club, got what wasn't right, amen, knocked all the dust off of everything, felt convicted. Now you got married. You pressured him into marrying you, but you don't want to be his wife. Woo! See, you gotta, you got to look at that thing and say, what am I asking for? Am I asking to be a wife or am I asking to be screwed? Am I asking to have great sex? Or am I asking to serve my husband? Those are tough questions. And you have to be really mature to answer those questions for yourself. Some of you, you need to ask your friends what you're really looking for because they'll tell you the truth. Amen. But, but, but we have to be able to examine ourselves and see what is it that we're really looking for. Husbands, same thing. Did, why, why did you want her? Because it was fat. Amen. And so you had to see if it was as good as it looked. Amen. And then you tore it up. And now that it's torn up, now you don't feel like being bothered. Now you want to watch the game. Now, now you don't want to uh, you don't want to cuddle no more. A brother will cuddle if it's going to help him get to home base. Y'all yeah. know what home base is. A brother will cuddle. A brother will buy flowers. A brother will listen to love songs. A brother will read poetry. A, a brother will walk in the park and hold hands. A brother will go to church. Amen. If that's going to help him get to home base, he will speak in tongues. He'll get baptized. He'll fall out in the floor. He'll, he'll, he'll be a minister. He'll be whatever you want him to be if that's going to help him get to home base. But once he's at home base and he got the key, all of the sudden, all of these other things begin to arise or, or, or all that other warm and fuzzy goes away. Why? Because he didn't want to be warm and fuzzy. He didn't want to get his rocks off. And, and you sexy and you hot. And so the next time he want to get his rocks off, he's going to get his rocks off again. But he ain't going to kiss you. And he ain't going to hug you. And he ain't going to cuddle. And he don't want to Netflix and chill. He don't quarantine over his friend house. Amen. And, and you can't figure out what happened and what's wrong. It's because there was never an established relationship outside of physical sexual desire. That you never fell in love with his mind. You never, you never fell and you never even knew what he really liked because you were too busy trying to get to the sexual part. I mean, let's be honest. It's almost like a, a, a date that we should uh, cherish. We remember that first kiss. Uh, we remember the first time. And, and you remember all of that. But what's his favorite color? What's his favorite sport? What was the worst thing that ever happened in his life? What are the broken things in his life that he hasn't overcome yet? What are the things that he really needs support with? What's his dream that's been buried? You don't know that. You don't know that because you were too busy trying to do the grown folk. Now you find out five years later after you married, amen, that, that, that he always wanted to be nothing. 
and you're frustrated because you're in a relationship with nothing. And it's amazing. I ain't going to say nobody's name, but it's amazing because that's the time that you come to the pastor and you come to the pastor and say, this is not what God wanted me to have. This is not the person that God has for me. God wants me to be happy. God wants me to be with a godly man. God wants me to be with He always wanted that for you. That didn't just come up just in the last few days. That didn't just come up in the last few years. But you were ignoring his desire when you were making the decision, amen, to make a covenant with him in spite of what God was saying. You weren't asking God. Now, you have to know how God is. And I know I'm almost out of time. But you have to know how God is about marriage. God honors marriage. Amen. God honors covenant. Amen. If you want to know what's important with God, look at where he makes the word covenant. Amen. When he made a, a, a covenant with Abraham, he said, this is what's going to happen. And he always supported his covenant with Abraham. When Jesus came, it was the satisfaction of his covenant with his people. He promised he would save Israel. When Jesus returns, he's still keeping his covenant with Israel in spite of all of the Gentiles that's gotten saved. Amen. God honors and keeps covenant. When he made a covenant with Saul to be king, amen, he, he stepped aside. He stepped aside and let Saul be king. So much so that when he rejected Saul, amen, his words to Samuel were, why are you still praying for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him? Amen. But 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 he recognized that Saul was still king. He rejected him, but he was still king. When David came along, Saul was still king. Saul didn't say, "Well, David is the king now, and you got to." And, and and God did not uh, give David permission to kill Saul because he made a covenant with him to make him king, even though he had rejected him. When Israel was clamoring and said, we want a king, give us a king like we can, so we can be like the other nations. God said very clearly, uh, you, you making a mistake by, by wanting them other kings because up until now, I was your king. He said, but I'm recognizing that you would rather have Saul than have me. And so God stepped aside and let Israel have Saul. He told them what Saul was going to be, but he stepped aside and let them have Saul. As soon as they decided that they didn't like Saul, he didn't step in and say, I knew that, so now I'm going to step back and be king again. Nope. Now David is king. Now Solomon is king. Now Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And all down, the, now the generations of the kings, is because God is out of the king business in your life. He said, I'm going to have me a king. And that king came later. Don't make me hoop. Amen. But that king of kings and Lord of lords coming. Amen. But he said, but now this is your king. And so I honor the covenant relationship with the king so much so that David said, you're supposed to touch not God's anointed and do his prophet no harm because he's the one that made the covenant with Saul. And it's not my job to break a covenant that God made with Saul. See how he feels about covenant? So here's what he says about man and wife. He said, what God has brought together let no man put asunder. That's the same thing as touching the anointed. That's the same thing as breaking the covenant that's been made between man and woman. It's the same way of being made between God and a king. It's the same way of being made between God and Abraham because God honors the covenant that you make. And so God will never tell you to break covenant. That's just against his character. He's just, he's more just than that. He's not going to tell you, abandon the covenant because we don't like it. He didn't like the relationship he had with Saul, but he honored the relationship he had with Saul. He said to Saul, if you would have been obedient, I would have established your kingdom forever. Amen. But Saul's disobedience is what got Saul put out. God never, watch this, this is kind of deep, I just got this fact. God never dethroned Saul. His relationship with Saul was over. His, 
his, his, his love, his affection and, and fellowship with Saul was over because he had rejected Saul, but he never removed Saul from the throne. So he, he didn't allow David to remove Saul from the throne. It was the other man that killed Saul, and it was so wrong for the other man to kill whom God had covenanted that David killed the man that killed Saul because they didn't have permission to break God's covenant. See, see, God is, is consistent. That's what makes him just. And so, and so when we start talking about divorce, that's another class, but, but when we realize that what God has brought together, there was never a plan for it to be made a, broken asunder. That's why you got oxytocin. That's why these hormones is going up. That's why they become no longer twain, but one flesh. Amen. And no man is supposed to break them asunder. Amen. That's the reason why we mix the rice. That's the reason, reason why we stir the sand. That's the reason why we light the unity candle. Because these two individuals are gone, and now there's just one. And you can't make the one separate again. You can take two and make them one, but you can't make one and make them two. You can take one and make it half. But you can't make it two again because it's one. Amen. And so when you take one and you make it half, now you got broken. And so you took one thing that was two things that was made one and then you pulled them apart and made it half and now it's broken. And then the half goes and gets into a relationship with somebody else. Amen. That's a half. And then they become two halves. Amen. And then they're broken and now they're a quarter of what they used to be. And then they keep taking their broken self into more and more relationships, trying to be made whole. Amen. But all they do is try to join with other broken people. Amen. Which causes them to be even more broken. And, and then we find ourselves repeating the sins of our past and repeating the flaws and the traps and the snares that have so utterly forsaken us over the years. Amen. And we're frustrated and we're depressed. And we're all of those things because we've never been made whole because we're broken. Amen. And the only thing that can make you whole is to go back to the altar. Amen. Give Jesus your life. Repent for your sins and let him heal you. Let him restore you. Let him make you whole. And then when he makes you whole, then flee the tree. Stay away from the thing that keeps getting you broken. It's not the person that broke you. It's the sin that broke you. It's not, the, it's not that you got the wrong person. It's that you're doing it the wrong way. And so if we keep doing it the wrong way and expecting different results, that's insanity. And it's not going to work for you. And it's not going to work for them. And it's not going to work for the people that's watching you. And it's going to be a whole trail of mess. Even in a lot of cases, there's people that are together and they decided to stay together, but they're not happy. And they're not happy because it's built upon a shaky foundation. If you married today, and some of you are married today, and you got married on false pretenses or for the wrong relations, for wrong reasons, go back to the altar. Amen. You repent. Don't worry about your spouse getting it right. You go repent. Then pray for them. Okay, I'm not preaching good. Let's say this. Why carest thou about the, uh, the speck that's in your brother's eye and don't observe the beam that's in your own eye? First, remove the beam out of your eye so that you can see how to get the speck out of your brother's eye. If you understand that parable, then I'm saying to you, get you right. You repent. Realize what's been broken in you. Realize what you've been trying to satisfy. It's not that he's not enough. It's that he's not him. He's not the other guy. He's not the other people that you've been trying to connect with down through the years. And you're trying to make them what you left. You're trying to make them what you lost. You're trying to make them better when all they are is themselves. And they're good enough by themselves to be themselves. But they'll never be good enough to be what you lost. They'll never be good enough to be what you imagine. They'll never be good enough to be what you dream. You just have to let them be the dream. But instead, we, we uh, uh, soil the dream by, by bringing it into this forbidden place. So what do we do? How do we make this right? 
How do we fix what's wrong with us? How do we fix what's broken in us? I'm telling you, uh, this this here uh, fornication and and sexual relationships, amen, in and out of a marriage, amen. Uh, here's here's where people get messed up. You wonder how could he go and cheat on you? How could he commit adultery, amen? If he loved me, amen. And I understand why you would ask that question, but the better question is, uh, was he a fornicator? See, if he was a fornicator, then what he had was he was out of control sexually. Especially if you're telling me it's a believer and they saved and they're, and they're fornicating. What, what that means, I don't care if he's a pastor. I don't care if he's a deacon. I don't care if she's a missionary mother, apostle, or whatever she we may be. Amen. If you are fornicating and you're a believer, Amen. Then what's wrong with us is that we are physically out of control. The scripture says that we cannot control our body. And if we cannot control our body to the point that we can't help it, amen, and, and we need to be delivered, amen, because our passion is not for the person. Our passion is to satisfy the sexual desire. And if that's the case, then you marry the fornicator. So you marry somebody that's fit, that's sexually out of control. So when the next situation comes along, then that fornicator just becomes an adulterer because they are not committed to God and they're not committed to you. They're just committed to satisfying their sexual desire. So when their sexual desire is not being satisfied here, they go and they satisfy it there. And so somebody is going to say, well, what about when I'm doing everything he wants, everything she asks, all the time, whenever they want it, I'm Johnny on the spot, I'm ready to give it, and they still go do it somewhere else. That's because they're out of control. They're not demonstrating love by having sex with you. They're demonstrating the, the need to satisfy a physical desire. And if that physical desire is greater than their commitment to God, then they're not going to have a greater commitment to you than they have to God. So whenever that physical desire stirs up again, you have a lot of people that it's not even about the sex. It's because they want to feel some type of way. It's because they're just not satisfied because sin is never Satisfied. How do you fix it? Go back to the altar. Go back to God. Say, God, I'm sorry. This is broken in me. And Apostle K. Hill will say, go get on the altar and hold on. So you see, in, in a lot of cases, you could have a better relationship if you would be free. If you can get you free in that place, then you would get to a place to where you could bring better to the relationship. What would it be like if instead of bringing the forbidden fruit to Adam, what would it be like if Eve said, I'm going to flee the fruit? See, if Eve would flee the fruit, then she would bring the forbidden thing into her marriage and then she would not lead her husband, amen, to sin. This is not about a gender thing, who did what and whose fault was what. It ain't about that. Uh, if if, if Eve would have stayed away from the tree, amen, she would not have brought temptation to Adam. And she would have protected their covenant relationship with God just by being sure that she was out of play, in play. If it was Adam and he was tempted to eat the fruit, it's the same thing. If he would have said, no, we're not going to eat this fruit. Amen. I don't know if he probably had a little better grasp on where his wife was. Maybe it would have been a little better. If he would have recognized that his wife was hanging around too close to the tree and maybe led her into another place where they're far away from that. If you know that that's the struggle or the potential struggle, are you encouraging that or are you fleeing that? Do you trust God enough, amen, to not give it up? Do you trust God enough to wait? 
Do you trust God enough to keep it sacred? Amen. Or, or do you feel like you've got to give him some or he's going to give it to somebody else? I was in, I was in, let me be a little transparent. I was in a, a sexual relationship. Amen. And I was wrong. Amen. I was fornicating and I was saved and sanctified and preaching and all of that good stuff like that. Amen. But when I got, when it comes down to it, I was wrong. And I was in this sexual relationship and I recognized that I was wrong and I was convicted by God and God said, you need to stop. And I said, you're right. I need to stop. And I made a decision that I wanted to stop. And I went to the girl that I was in a relationship with then. And I said, look, I've got a conviction on my heart that I need to stop. And I really uh, want us to stop and, and to not do this anymore. And I was really sincere. And, and as I went to her and I said, I, I want us to stop. She said, why? Why should we stop? Because if you don't give it to me, you're going to give it to somebody else. And I was like, wow. So what am I, the vending machine? You know, uh, I, I might as well give it to you because somebody going to get it. She wasn't even willing to pray with me to say, I, I, I respect the fact that you're trying to do what's right. Amen. And so I want to support you in doing what's right, even if that means I have to flee, even if that means I have to suffer. Even if that means we have to not be in a relationship, it's more important to me that you keep your covenant with God than to satisfy me sexually. No, she said, might as well give it to me. If you don't give it to me, you're going to give it to the next girl anyway. See, that was enough reason for me to leave that relationship. So why didn't I leave? So why did I stay in that relationship? So why did we keep having sex? Because I never got healed. I, I, I knew I had conviction, but I didn't get delivered. So you got to be able to take the conviction to, that God gives and get yourself on the altar. So you can be free. And then once you're free, then you can free yourself from the situation and free the other person that's in that relationship. Maybe they're weaker than you. Maybe they have a greater problem than you. Maybe they need more help than you. Maybe you're the problem. Maybe you're the reason that they're in that place in the first place. First, get the beam out of your eye. This is not about judgment. This is about recognizing where we are as the people of God. It's about understanding what helps and what hurts our relationship. Some of you are courting somebody right now and you're making a decision right now about how you're going to uh, handle sex and things like that. I'm encouraging you. Hold on. Hold on and stay with God. Some of you are in relationships right now and, you, and you're trying to get somebody because you need to get your rocks off. And I'm encouraging you, get on the altar first. Don't ruin that person's life. Don't ruin the relationship of that person because you're really just trying to have a sexual fantasy fulfilled or a romantic fantasy fulfilled. Amen. Make sure that you're whole when you go into that marriage. Make sure that you're whole before you go into the next relationship and you were broken by the last guy or you were broken by the last girl. Go back and be healed. Be delivered. Be made whole. And then take your whole self out and be in the relationship that God would ordain for your life. And then manage the relationship in a way that God would ordain. I'm so glad that we're able to have this kind of open discussion. I'm glad that we're able to be real with one another and recognize that we do struggle and we do have issues. And some of us are, if you want to call it worse than others, Amen. There's no great or small sin, but you can be deeper entrenched in whatever it is that you're struggling with. Amen. And as much as that's what's going on in your life, I encourage you, this is what the church is about. If we can't heal in this area, then we ain't no need in us trying to cast out devils. Amen. Amen. If we can't, if we can't deliver in this area, there's no need in us trying to go out and save the world. We can't even save ourselves. Amen. 
Amen. And so God wants to challenge us to grow in this area, to be strong. Amen. Be better husbands. Be better wives. Amen. When it comes to sex, love your wife like God loved the church. When it comes to uh, sex, serve your husband. Give your husband pleasure. That's what it's supposed to do. Be everything that God has called you to do and live that relationship in a way that gives him glory. I hope you're encouraged by this. I can't wait to hear all of your feedback, your uh, thoughts, your criticisms, your questions, whatever it may be. Again, if you have something that's personal that you don't want to discuss publicly, I welcome you to inbox me. Amen. Please keep it classy. Uh, this is not an invitation for an inappropriate conversation, but it is definitely an invitation to help you in an area that you may need help or be struggling in. We are praying for you, and we can't wait to see you again next time. Continue to support our ministry and follow our ministry, both of our churches. Amen. Stay faithful to your local church. Continue to give. Be safe out there. Watch out for, the, for your neighbor as well as yourself, and we're praying for you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen.